Okay, welcome everybody uh, to today's safety roundtable. Uh, just people joining the Zoom as we speak. <clears throat> um, thanks for joining uh, this session. First of our lunchtime sessions, having changed the time of these uh, these roundtables per public demand, we did a we did a poll uh, and. Uh, several hundred people voted and it was overwhelming to move to lunch times so uh, hopefully this works better for everybody um, and uh, going forward we'll try and stick to this time <clears throat> uh, at least for a period of, uh, of a few weeks anyway and see uh, if we get um, good responses and good uptake and lots of people joining and everyone's happy uh, which is obviously the the point of this we're doing this for um, for, for you guys uh, to uh, connect with each other, to uh, cultivate relationships and to collaborate and share ideas at the end of the day. So it uh, looks like everything's working. We're live uh, on LinkedIn and uh, there's people in the Zoom session. So thank you for joining and uh, let's get cracking. So we're gonna to talk today about proactivity and safety and raise the question of, uh, do we have enough of it? Do we need more of it? And um, how could we go about achieving um, a higher degree of proactivity with our safety work? Now, just to warn you, uh, I've got a home, no, a co-worker working from home today, my four-year-old son, who is a little bit worse for wear. Uh, so um, hopefully he's set up nicely um, watching a TV show uh, in the next room, but um, uh, there's a chance he might come and uh, come and join us. And I'm sure he's got some great insights around proactivity and safety. So if he does, we'll be in for a treat. Um, if you're watching this on LinkedIn and you want to join us on the Zoom, uh, head to safetyroundtable.co.uk and sign up. And also, uh, if you're watching this, uh, give us a like, uh, give us a comment and say hello. Uh, I will monitor the um, the feed, uh, I can see there's uh, uh, sort of 15 or so of you on there at the moment. Uh, so say hello, uh, give us a comment, give us your thoughts, and I'll try and include you in the session as well. So let's make a start then. Um, <clears throat> let's start with a definition of proactivity. Um, so this is, uh, this is one that I found. So proactivity or proactive behavior refers to self-initiated behavior that endeavors to solve a problem before it has occurred. Proactive behavior involves acting in advance of a future situation rather than reacting. So acting in advance of a future situation rather than reacting. So um, let's open this up for some thoughts, initial thoughts. Um, hit me up in the chat or if you want to unmute or stick your hand up, uh, go to reactions, raise your hand. Uh, I've got one hand raised from Merza. So do you want to uh, unmute yourself and give us your thoughts you know how, do, do you think we do this in safety already i mean i feel like actually about the proactive behavior as the definition says uh thinking about something before it occurs so i feel like that it can be like a paranoia also it can be like a fear it hmm. can be sometime you know like uh uh the extra planning or the over planning which can even stop someone from moving forward so, I mean, it should be in a moderate level, but if you'll just try to think about each and everything, then we can't move because there are a lot of risk all around us and we need to have a calculated move. I love that. I think that's a really insightful um, point because we want to be proactive, maybe, uh, but we definitely want to be proportionate, don't we? Because, yeah, as you say, you could be paralyzed by fear. You know, just think of leaving your house if you were... Um, if you thought of every single potential risk that could happen uh, after leaving your house, you'd probably never leave your house um, because there's a lot of bad things that could happen. Um, so we definitely need to uh, to be uh, proportionate in our in our approach so that we're not um, yeah, we're not suffering from that kind of paralysis. <clears throat> excuse uh, excuse my French. Um, anyone else got any initial thoughts on that question of do we are we proactive already in safety? Anything else that anybody would like to share? 
Hi, Christian. Well, first and foremost, let me say thank you. Uh, my first safety round table because ah, I've not been welcome. able to attend because of meetings. So thank you very much for, for moving that to the lunchtime session. It certainly sits well with me and I do hope it will for others. Um, yes. With regards to proactivity, I think it's, it's subject to interpretation. Many individuals, many OSH professionals and employers would say that they are being proactive because there's a number of RAMs and risk assessments and policies out there to try and, you know, a lead uh, uh, or effectively negate any of the risks or limit any of the risks and mitigate accordingly um, on any of the businesses. But the reality is we're not proactive. In the main, not all, but in the main, there tends to be very much a reactive process there. Yes, we have those policies. Yes, we have um, health and safety officers out there, but depending on the race to the bottom, whether it be cost implications, etc., it tends to be proportionate as to whether the business really, really includes health and safety as their key top driver. Many businesses refer to health and safety being their mm. utmost priority, but the reality is often it's about profits over people uh, mm -hmm. and that's quite sad. So yes, I do believe we do need to have a more proactive approach across all industries, across all employers, all businesses and with every individual concerned. Good stuff. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alan, and uh, welcome and thank you for joining. Um, there's a lot of P's we're coming up with today. Proactivity, proportionality, profit, people. Loving it. Um, and thank you for joining. Good to have you on board. Uh, Mark, you've got your hand up. Hi, yeah, uh, um, just the same as Yvonne as well. Thanks. For, uh, it's my first time. Uh, the morning wasn't working for me, but a lunch and learn. Uh, I can always dial in and uh, thanks for that. Um, just on the proactivity, um, I, I work uh, primarily in uh, pharma, biopharma, API, medical devices companies and I would say that they are very proactive um, right now um, even even down to the fact that they're investigating their near misses that they're going above and beyond looking at things the risk assessments now are legislative that we have to do it so I think there's a lot of things that can be done to make us better um, yeah. we are being proactive but I think that we need to be the risk assessments need to be more in depth so i think people need to go deeper down into their risk assessments not just on incidents but to dig into the near misses or the uh, the things that have been reported even go so far as to look at their see and act culture um when oh i spoke to somebody not holding the handrail going down the stairs i think they need to even go to that level when they're doing their risk assessments and then the what comes from that is when you put forward that argument into management you know you can actually show all of this accumulation of data that I know a lot of companies have and you can use that then to be even more proactive so yes I think they are proactive but I think there's always a case for better but I think it, it is improving. Hmm. Thank you and, and well thanks for joining Mark. Um, my uh, experience I'm going to share some thoughts and experiences on this topic in a minute from my from my past but um, you're in a sector <clears throat> a bit like um, I was chatting to, to a couple of people the other day from sort of oil and gas, for example, and and, and, and it is, I think, just more, um, you, that, those sectors are just more attuned to, because it's high hazard and high risk, you know, to, to being safe. And it does kind of run through the the blood and the veins of, of people in those industries, perhaps a little bit more than, than in some other, um, some other sectors. So, um, um, yeah, I think you're you're in a fortunate position to be to be in one of those sexes. Oh, I'm loving this. Lots of hands up. Uh, Sue, I think you were first. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Um, <clears throat> I'm with camera off first because I have my sandwich. Um, <laughs> now. Um, I, yeah, I think we I think some of the data we use tells us where to um, reactive sometimes because I think boards love to see things like reportable incidents, serious incidents. Whereas I think if they were really starting to analyze some of the lower level incidents or if they were starting to look at, um, you know, trends in occupational health referrals, lost days, I think that would be a much more reactive, um, a more proactive mm. approach. So I think that can restrict us sometimes. Yeah. And what's interesting about what you've said, <clears throat> which I agree with, is that <clears throat> You need to be a little bit react. You need to be a little bit reactive because you need to be looking at what's actually going on to then be proactive. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting, an interesting thing to think about. Uh, hi, Tim from Ottawa. Uh, thanks for for giving your view in in the chat. Um, being proactive often gives people more time to work on solutions, which take time to implement. 
often reactive solutions are limited by available time. Fully agree with that. Um, Rosemary. Do you want to unmute your hands up or if not? There you go. Is that better? There we go. Yes. Good afternoon. Sorry about that. I'm great with this mute button. <laughs> Since the last time I was actually on a call, I've actually changed companies. And one of the great things about the new company is basically I'm taking health and safety back to ground, grassroots. Mm. Getting rid of everything that's been done before, obviously archiving the stuff in case it's yeah. an incident, but you get the gist. Yeah. And what I'm, where I'm going is actually lead safety. So giving people a lot more easy access, simple information. So they actually manage their own safety rather than actually waiting for an accident to happen. We'll try and actually get people to a point where they're trained, understand, know what they're looking for. Uh, we've had a lot of um, near misses within the organization. Um, and that leads me to believe that there's a, a, a hunger for it. So for me, it's actually hopefully quite a, um, a straightforward process of actually changing it from lag to lead safety. Mm. We've had a question actually in, in on LinkedIn from from Vince Butler, who uh, I'm surprised, Vince, you need to get on the Zoom, mate. Um, but uh, thank you for, <laughs> for joining. But he said actually, and it just you, 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 what you said, Rosemary, um, made me think of it. Um, question: He's interested to ask people: Is a near miss event, quote unquote, a leading or lagging indicator? So if anybody's got any, anybody's lead. got any thoughts on that? Absolutely, a um, lead event. And and one of the things I'm doing here as well is combining health and safety with facilities because. Yeah incidents have been or near miss incidents have been reported but they've just gone into a black hole so mm. actually i'm now joining the link together so we've actually rather than actually letting a near miss become the next big accident we're trying to close that gap and actually get things done before there's a disaster before somebody gets injured yeah. so yeah for me near misses are very much about lag it's about being observant it's about reporting it and actually having the confidence to report stuff even if you know you think oh my god i'm being terribly boring about this report it because it might actually save somebody's life or save somebody's yeah. limb yeah no absolutely yeah good stuff all right thank you and good to see you good to see you back with us again um and congrats on the new role thank you i think <laughs> um okay I'll, I'll take nikki and mirza and then i'll 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 try and uh, make some progress uh, but the, this one is isn't there's not going to be much of me talking today guys i'm really interested to get uh, and i'm loving the the interaction so nikki do you want to unmute and, and uh, give us your thoughts on this yeah, afternoon, Christian. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So firstly, yes, I definitely agree with what Tim was saying about it's a time. There is a time issue there. Uh, closing the loop, it's it's OK to find these things, but unless we properly root cause out what, what is happening at the bottom of it all, we're never going to draw the line in the sand. But within the food industry, um, I've found the most proactive approach to be more around the type of inspections and the systems that we put in around that. So we tend yeah. to do um, sort of a systems based procedural type inspections, the Gemba walk, where you're going out and you're actually looking for set things. So you walk the department and you say in what are the types of issues? I went back six months on the accidents and, you know, then went in to say, do these things still exist today? Um, so it's sort of a management driven thing where you're sort of looking for those on a regular basis. That's quite a structured managed approach. Mm -hmm. But then also tailor that with um, it, it's not quite a behavioral safety program because we're not ready for it yet, but it's got a behavioral element. So it's conversations yeah. that we, we do have a targeted approach, but it's basically going out and you are asking if you see something, whether it be and we have three three areas unsafe condition unsafe act or a positive working mm -hmm. it's either underpinning what somebody's doing you know because we're very good at looking for the negative but not the positive so it's about yeah. underpinning what we want people to do but at the same time then really asking the question rather than just saying not to do something it's can i ask you why you're out here not yeah. where your is, or can i ask you why you've chosen to take that action and it's like a, a, a window of opportunity. The answers that you get is, uh, you know, would, would never be what you would uh, understand. You know, it's it's re really great. And then things like bringing the safety committee out of a meeting room and walking the shop floor, mm. or, or um, you know, definitely walking the department with key people. And lastly, probably setting standards. So, 
maybe sort of taking your top three key issues and putting up a board in, in, in whatever area and saying, these are the three things we're going to focus on. We're not going to accept these within here, that type of thing. So they're, they're sort of the types of approaches that I've found have been quite useful in the past. Good stuff. Thank you. And yeah, you're jumping a little bit ahead because the, the, the second bit of this is what can we, how can we go about doing it? So you've shared some great ideas there. And I think asking those questions is so powerful. Um, and it's something that we sometimes uh, are guilty of. We work in these kind of silos and we don't think about um, engaging with, with everybody that we need to. Um, Merza, you've got another comment. Yeah, it's a quick one, actually. Uh, the thing is that, I mean, if we talk about safety, if we are proactive uh, in uh, safety industry or no. So if I divide, uh, you can say, proactivity into two parts, like assessment and the management, like the corrective action. So from an assessment part, yes, I think uh, most of the safety professionals are uh, really proactive and they're trying to identify any hazard, anything that can harm anyone. Uh, but the only you can say problem comes when they are trying to uh, give suggestions and solutions and they're trying to manage, trying to address those uh, hazards. Hmm. So that part is even sometime being identified. Everybody know that that is there. It can cause someone harm or it can result in some accident. But it is, you know, like a approach from uh, those, you can say, people who are controlling the funding who are controlling the budget. So due to that reason, sometimes it's not happening actually. So proactivity, we can say that yes, from assessment, yes. From our management, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, very interesting. And we've got, sir, we, it's a great international group today. We've got uh, 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 Jorge, I think is how you pronounce your name, in from Mexico. We've got some people from, uh, from Nigeria as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining wherever you are. And uh, one of the reasons that, uh, lunchtime maybe works better is because it does kind of land in in a few different time zones a bit better as well uh, so thanks for those uh, initial thoughts um uh we won't be death by powerpoint today but i just thought i'd share some of my kind of experience and obviously um for those that don't know me um i'm a specialist in the field of slips and falls so you guys are much um have much broader uh, areas of knowledge and expertise uh, than, than me, uh, but so I, but I can share kind of what I've seen um, in, in my space uh, and hopefully that might um, prompt some further thinking um, about this uh, this conversation. So um, I'm quite a big fan of, uh, of, of sort of testing uh, views and opinions in the marketplace and getting people's getting people's um, to answer questions and tell me where they're at and what they think about certain things. Um, I'm just being joined by one of my cats now as well. Um, and uh, and so one of the questions I asked a while ago was, um, has anybody you know or yourself suffered a slip and fall? And 71% of people said, yes, um, either I've slipped myself or I know somebody that's close to me um, that has slipped. So a lot, big chunk of people um, have slipped. Um, and then if we look at, uh, here's the other cat. <laughs> Uh, if we look at things from a building management perspective around uh, facilities management, safety, keeping buildings safe, what proportion of floors in your building get regularly wet or contaminated? And again, two thirds of buildings have floors, people would say, that are getting regularly wet or contaminated. Okay, so we've got people are slipping, floors are getting wet or contaminated. And we, we're kind of accepting of this. I've shared this slide before on um, on the safety roundtable, so but I, you have to forgive me because it's just it just it just slaps you around the face. You know, slips and falls uh, is a is a long running problem. It isn't going anywhere. Year after year after year, uh, we're in the same position. So we've got some data, um, <clears throat> but yet um, when 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 I ask about you know when did you last have a slip test of your building, bearing in mind all of this data and the fact that we we know people that have slipped and the fact that our floors are getting wet. Very, very few buildings have had a slip test. So in this area, can we say we're really being proactive, given this is the largest cause of accident, injury and claim? And that's just a snapshot from my world of slips, but that sort of, you know, my, uh, my experience is that in this world anyway, where there is a lot of data, there is a lot of evidence, um, we're not being that proactive, we're being very much re reactive around you know, waiting for something bad to happen and then 
uh, doing something. I'd be interested to know whether people feel as if <clears throat> that approach is mirrored um, across other areas of safety. So thinking about something quite high frequency like manual handling uh, versus in an area such as, for example, falls from height where or fire where, you know, something catastrophic might happen. I don't know if anybody's got any any views on, on that. As you can see the chat's going, the chat's going wild. Um, feel free to uh, to pop your hand up if you've got any if you can share any insights on whether that sort of reactive approach that we see from slips is um, is mirrored in other areas. Um, Yvonne, yeah, proactivity of safety should be factored in the early procurement stage. In yeah, thinking specifically about construction, I fully agree with that. I mean, look, I got a phone call um, uh, about an hour ago from uh, an architect who has uh, got a building in London that they're handing over in two weeks and they've kind of just got to the end of the uh, this project project which has been going on for ages and realized oh hold on a sec the floors in the washrooms are slippery that's not very good <laughs> so, so you know I think the construction industry does need to to think about this um, Hi, Dave from uh, oshliteracy.org. That sounds like an interesting website. Um, there needs to be a more holistic approach to, to occupational safety health involving schools and other stakeholders. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think that there's, um, there's never been a better time uh, to work in this field, I would say. Uh, and I think there's a big opportunity. I was chatting to Laura Orcott about this on my podcast recently about getting involved and engaging with schools um, to try and get people uh, on board um, early earlier on in their lives and, and actually be aspirational towards um, towards a, a career in in, uh, in health and safety. Um, Yvonne, you got your hand up. Yeah, in response to that, um, so I'm involved with IOSH in the North East of Scotland branch. Hmm. Um, and back in 2017-18, we set the way with regards to educa educational engagement with schools, really, really targeting the young people, predominantly secondary school uh, young people, but then we went to primary schools as well. It was very, very, very well received. We managed to show them what a risk assessment was. They created their own risk assessments, uh, hazard awareness, etc. And that was just a ba base level with a view to taking it back to IOSH, where we've effectively said to IOSH, look, this is our proposal. You know, our children are the future generation of our workforce, of our, of our leaders, of our community, and we need to really, really engage with them to fully understand uh, the, the whole aspect around health, safety and well-being, mm -hmm. and how then that subsequently goes into the workplace. Um, IOSH have a paper sitting in front of them, I believe it's going to, to, to council um, this, okay. this week or month, relating to that whole education piece and the, the um, promotion of, mm. of OSH on a wider scale, certainly UK, I would hope that then that would subsequently be adopted on a global global scale. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what comes out of that. But there's a huge emphasis right now. I mean, certainly I work in construction, I said that before through my chat. Um, I'm, I'm in and out of schools all of the time, whether that be nursery, primary, secondary, colleges, universities, etc. And, and I don't see why we shouldn't have that embedded, not mm. just within the curriculum, not just within the curriculum, but to have that uh, forward progression as well, to encourage the next generation of, of OSH professionals and also leaders to, for them to, everyone to be involved. This isn't just an adult issue. It's not just an employer issue. Everyone needs to be involved and we need to look at a full engagement and holistic approach to this. Mm. I'd love to um, talk about that on uh, on the podcast at some point. So um, perhaps when there's you've made a bit um, a bit more progress. Um, then uh, that'd be great. Whether it's you and or and or other people, it'd be great to get on and, and talk about that because I think that's no a, a topic that um, you know that we should all be uh, pushing forward and, and espousing. And yeah, I can see there's a few a few comments in the chat supporting you. So uh, yeah, good good on you for that. Um, so how how then uh, can we be more proactive? So we've we've shared a couple of thoughts already, um, but just to, just some thoughts that I jotted down and hopefully these will prompt some um, some thinking uh, from everybody and, and, and uh, we can have a chat about it. So um, I think mindset is is really critical with all of these types of topic. I think if we can't get the mindset right in our own minds, if you know what I mean, we've got to get our own mindset 
um, in tune with being more proactive to start with. But then it's a case of, well, what, what's the uh, prevailing mindset in the organization and how can we try to influence that? Because um, if we are uh, reactive, if we're not putting so much importance on safety uh, as an organization, even though you as the, uh, the, the safety and health uh, uh, professional, uh, I'm sure, are, uh, then we're going to struggle. So I think thinking about the mindset is really, really important. Um, I would say engagement is really important as well. <clears throat> and by this, I mean, we've got to go and we talked about a bit about this earlier by with asking questions. We need to be going up and down in the organization. We need to be going side to side in the organization. And I would say we even need to be going outside the organization as well, because we need to be thinking about um, our key stakeholders, such as, you know, our key suppliers, cleaning, cleaning companies, FM providers, um, insurers, brokers, um, uh, local authorities, you know, there, there are so many um, stakeholders that, um, that we should be getting, uh, getting involved into these discussions. I think having a, a plan uh, is really important. Oh, Matthew, put your hand up. Do you want to come in on this? Yeah, I think from an engagement point of view, it, you know, I mean, I, I see within my own organisation, uh, by engaging with the workforce, you know, I mean, we have this... You know, when we discussed risk assessments earlier, and, and I think we're in danger sometimes of the, uh, the, the business leader or the occupational health person uh, doing the risk assessment. But for me, it's that engagement, getting the grassroots doing it, because what we think is right might not necessarily translate to how it can actually be done on the floor. So getting that process right, getting that engagement right, and taking those people along on the journey uh, to to reduce the risk, uh, and I'm also a, a big believer because uh, again I work in the construction sector where we we could have a site with three people on, or we could have 40, 50, 60 people on that site. So it's getting to that point. If you think about like the Bradley curve, getting to a interdependent uh, sort of behaviour and culture within the organisation, so that everyone's looking out for each other mm. rather than just putting your hard hat on when the safety man comes around or, or, or the, the manager comes around. So I think engagement is is, is pivotal in, uh, in in getting this right. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, love, that's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, and Sue uh, has mentioned in the comments, engagement with your senior leaders is key. Uh, definitely <clears throat> agree with that. I think we've got to get this right at all levels. Um, what I see a lot is that um, I tend to either find that the senior leaders are brought into this uh, or they are on the sort of platitude end of the spectrum and they, you don't tend to find much in between. I think it's almost a bit binary. Um, and, and if they are brought in, <clears throat> the key then is to, is to go down and actually educate the people in the, in the mid-management because quite often you find examples of decisions being made which are not really in line with the strategy or the or the vision uh, of the senior leadership team, uh, but are driven by things like getting budgets and P&Ls in the right place, um, because the people uh, in, 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 that are making those decisions operationally are incentivized by those metrics, and therefore, you know, their job is to get those metrics right. So we've got to we've got to get that engagement um, uh, going. Craig, you put your hand up. How are you doing? Hi, yeah, not too bad. Sorry, I was a bit late joining. Uh, I had a meeting from work. Oh, that's all right. You're banned. Uh, You're banned from future events now. <laughs> um, I, I basically, I, I come from a uh, construction background. I was a construction, well, health and safety manager within a uh, kind of like a, a construction industry trade. Um, and from my experience of what management there were doing and what I'd seen on site was the reason why I left that role. There was no buy-in. There was no support really. It was kind of like money talk, safety doesn't as, as much. So I kind of left and now I'm working in an environment within the UK energy sector, um, highly regulated. There is like, it's like day and night, the difference between the two areas, especially mm. when it comes to the buy-in of management. Uh, I'm working on a project at the moment to deliver um, supervisor manager training on uh, basically everything from post pre-job briefs, keeping it safe, communications, uh, 
um, escalate the escalation of um, aggression through to learning from previous examples and you know and it's just totally different the way that they approach it and the way that they buy into it. it mm. I mean we're, we're dealing with people from around the globe on this project now it's that big and it's been led from the top from the directors and the execs they're the ones that want this to be done because they know it's important and they're, they're giving us everything we need. That's the kind of buy-in that I think a lot yeah. of uh, companies need to need, need to look at really is how do you keep your guys safe? Do you want to be the one that has to tell their next of kin, for, unfortunately, stones, such and such has happened because I didn't really give them the instructions. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really supervising money talks more than you know anything else and that i just left the industry because of that and now where i am is absolutely fantastic good stuff and yeah it's a shame when uh these things are still happening isn't it because you know we all know that what the right thing to do is um but it's it's easy to not easy but it's it's common to do the sort of bare minimum and not really do the right thing if that makes sense so um i suppose yeah, that, totally. it, yeah it was a case of uh, even when i was doing face fit testing um as part of my role i was doing face fit testing for masks and it was kind of like refusing to face fit people who were not clean shaven yeah and then i was getting the rollick in we're going well you can't send them out to job now we can't build them out because you won't give them a face fit certificate hmm. and it's like well that they know the rules you know the rules they got to be clean shaven i'm not signing a piece of paper no that basically it's, says that i face fitted them when i know that they're not fit mm. so why would i put my name on the line for that yeah. um, and it was little things like that but it's it's so common in a lot of the i mean i do i used to do chairs and construction line applications for clients as well as my normal job and it was quite common that shortcuts were done because the you know because it was the easy route yeah yeah so leader you got to get your leaders in, involved you got to teach them educate them and then hopefully that will cascade down yeah yeah matthew's made a good a good comment in the chat here which is that <clears throat> um disappointing when leaders don't support the staff quickly see uh the tick box exercise if um uh and then engagement is lost. And, and this is something that I'm really uh, passionate about, which is that we we need to um, highlight all of this stuff and dr- draw as many links as we can between safety and for business performance and operational success. Because I think every, you know, whether somebody believes in safety being really, really, really important or not, they, they definitely will have believe in um, uh, operational you know excellence and high performance being really really important I'm sure uh, of that because that's just you know ingrained in any business and uh, and so I think the better job we can do at linking what we do and keeping people safe and it's not just about avoiding accidents it's also about the point that Matthew's made there which is if people don't feel safe they don't feel protected then you lose engagement you lose um, performance they're more likely to leave uh, and get another role, et cetera. Because, we, I mean, we've seen examples of that just on this call, right? We've Two or three people have said we I've left because there wasn't that engagement on safety. So, you know, we're, we're proving the point, but we've got to, got to do a better job, I guess, of, uh, of trying to get that across. Um, yeah, some, some really good stuff uh, happening in the chat. So uh, it's difficult for me to uh, stay on top of every single comment, but thank you for, for joining in. And please feel free to un- unmute and and join in if you want to uh, uh, to share um, over and above as well. Um, so other, other points that I had uh, thought about were <clears throat> obviously having a plan and having some kind of strategy. Um, so something written down that we can then get when we get on to the last point about monitoring, we can actually start to assess how well this is working. Because again, I think that the challenge around proactive measures is often that we are expending time, energy, and cost on something that we can't necessarily prove is a saving or a benefit or efficiency. So um, we've got to have a um, a plan, a strategy, something quantifiable that we can measure against. I think that will help us to support 
uh, to get the support from from more senior um, people. Uh, Vince has asked on uh, uh, on LinkedIn, how can we include occupational health risks into this proactive strategy? Consider the UK has 2.2 million construction workers at significant risk of um, silicosis. Where's the proactivity been to allow that horrible phenomenon to manifest? Yeah, don't think uh, don't think many people will be disagreeing with that. Um, communication. Tim's made a point in the chat here. Safety culture must be explained to all levels of management and has to be demonstrated by all. And that's kind of where I was coming at with uh, with this point about communication. So we need to. Uh, Lee from for Florida. Well, thanks for joining. Um, we need to uh, have our plan, have our strategy, get the engagement right so we know what we're doing, and then we've got to communicate um, the hell out of it, really, because otherwise it's going to fall down. Christian? Yes. Sorry, just... Um, hey, Neil. Just, just to sort of um, better know what you're saying about having a plan and communication. Um, having worked in quite a number of industry, quite a number of um, companies in the food industry, I've uh, come across exactly like everyone else has been saying here, a whole wide range of um, senior management attitudes to safety and uh, and their views on it. And from <clears throat> excuse me, from my point of view, yeah, your safety strategy has to buy into the company's goals stra uh, strategy. It's not a bolt on you can put on the side of any anything. It's got to tie in with the whole business ethos, um, and that way you get the buy in from uh, from the management level, the, the directors. Hmm. Um, and you can start to build bottom up as well, um, but that's that to me is absolutely key. If every, if everyone's singing from the same uh, same song sheet, it it makes it so much easier. Yeah, and I suppose <clears throat> the challenge uh, that we've got, I think, is I think we, you know, there's how how many of us are there? There's 25 of us on this call. There's another 10 or 15 watching along on LinkedIn, varying obviously as people come in and out. Uh, there might be some other people watching on. Twitter as well, and, and there'll be people watching this in, in replay, and the people that are watching this um, probably are all furiously agreeing with everything that we're all saying. <laughs> so the interesting thing is how can we, um, you know, how can we take this uh, from from our perspectives and get it uh, get it further out there in the world? Louis, uh, good to see you. Uh, see you soon. Um, Matthew. I think just to echo what you've just said there, uh, some of the positives of good health and safety and people feeling uh, that they're part of the organisation, they're involved, that engagement, uh, like I say, the selling point is is that staff retention, uh, that the, the people wanting to come and work in for the organisation as well. Uh, so like I say, sort of promoting all those benefits and, and we all know from just a housekeeping point of view that aids production doesn't it so the, the, i think there's a multitude of different selling points to uh, particularly in the current so uh, uh, market or employee market within the uk at the minute people yeah. are struggling to uh, recruit and retain staff so it's quite quite a buoyant market at the moment so mm. if you can sell those other the, those other wares as health and safety and tight all in together with the HRE stuff that I mean somebody touched upon occupational health there with the mental health element as well that actually there is support there we are here to uh, to, to help you as, mm. as an employer yeah I mean um, so many conversations I've been having recently are about uh, or not so much about but we always t end up talking about the fact that getting people is hard at the moment finding finding people is uh, it's difficult because yeah, sim, sim, you know we've got um, and most of the right people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> finding, good, finding good people. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, and that's that. Th those conversations are typically about safety and health professionals. Um, but I think th there's a wider point, you know, around uh, some, you know, somewhere that I go um, and and eat sometimes. You know, they they uh, they they're struggling to get staff, uh, even just to be bar staff and uh, and so on so uh, yeah it's uh, there's definitely some some issues there um, and yeah the last thing I was thinking of was monitoring so um, you know we, we, we've got to think about this put a strategy in place and then I think to to, to, to move organizations to be more proactive we've got to be able to monitor um, what we've done and sort of kind of prove the point I suppose that it was worth the bother um, of being more proactive in the first place because we can be proactive, but if we can't actually 
demonstrate and, and evidence kind of what we've done and some of the outcomes of that, then we're not going to be that proactive for long because no organization is going to be investing time, effort and cash into um, a black hole. As yes, as you say, uh, Rosemary, classic plan, do, check, act. Yeah, I uh, I don't have any original ideas. Um, Um, what's Lee saying? Lee's saying, Lee from Florida. Here in Florida, as you recover from a major hurricane, there's a massive influx of small businesses and contractors, but there'll be an additional spike in occupational accidents in the process. Yeah. Very little being done by most of these contractors to mitigate risk. And I suppose that comes back to one of the points that was raised earlier, which you may or may not have seen, Lee, which was that in a, in a, in a, in a sort of reactive sense, time is often um, of the essence. And then we just don't we don't necessarily do can't necessarily do things we don't have the time whereas proactively we've got we have got more time we have got more time um lillian uh most employees are negligent on safety issues they don't take it seriously so there's a big gap in the induction provided of which auditing may be needed as employees compliance after training and induction yeah i do think that we've talked a fair bit about induction in the chat today i noticed and getting the training right so i do think that that's really really uh, really really important Good stuff. Well, look, it's uh, we've almost done 45 minutes um, and um, I'm conscious of trying to keep these to about 45 minutes. Really enjoyed uh, today's session. Hopefully it's got the mind whirring a bit and, and uh, anybody joining in has got some thoughts uh, about how they can go away and be, uh, be a bit more proactive. Um, uh, you know, think about mindset, think about engagement, planning, communication, monitoring. Hopefully that's helpful in some way to, uh, to, to move you forward. Um, thank you all for, for joining. Uh, first of our lunchtime sessions, uh, lots of good engagement, lots of good in interventions and people keen to chat. I think perhaps uh, my main learning from this session is that um, uh, people seem to be much more happy to talk at 12.30 than at 9. Perhaps the caffeine at 9 hadn't quite kicked in into people, so I <laughs> do appreciate that. Um, I don't have a topic for you next week, actually, uh, so I'll think of one and I'll let you know. Uh, everybody that's on the Zoom will be on the on the emailing list and I'll stick it out on LinkedIn and stuff as well. So thanks very much for joining and we will see you all um, next week. <laughs>